Well, we are so excited to continue in this collection of talks. You know, we've been in, uh, this is the third week of what we're calling tension. I don't know if you've noticed there's some tense things going on in our world right now. Anybody experienced that yet? Okay, yep, liars, yep. And, and the reality is, is that we're living in a world today that has so much going on that we can even become numb to the reality of what's going on. We can, you know, oftentimes even try to check out and disengage in the areas that are so dismal, so difficult, so dark. And here, let me just say this really clearly. We're not out here trying to headhunt. We're not here going after hot topics. We believe that the church, Jesus's bride, should be well equipped to understand how we are to respond in these times of tension. And so if we find ourselves kind of touching on a topic that's a little sensitive to you, let me just tell you, it's very much so a subject in our context, in our greater communities. And so we've talked on a couple of things. The first week we talked about politics. Glory to God. It's incredible. If you've missed that, let me encourage you, please go watch that. I hope that and pray that that's a resource for us as the church. The second week we talked about money. Right? So we're talking about some hot topics here. If you meet someone and they say, who'd you, uh, uh, who'd you vote for and how much do you make? You'd be like, boy, bye. Get out of my face. We fighting. <laughs> You're like, aren't you the pastor? Well, I thought you couldn't tell with the mask on. Well, it has the logo right there. Anyways, got to go. <laughs> and, and, and these hot subjects, these tensions and topics can find us finding ourselves doing as the world does and it's a divide. Right? Can you see it? The fractures, the the frustrations, the pains. We find ourselves in this place, in this time, in this day where we are so separated. There's such extremes. Are you for us or are you for them? Are you over here or are you over there? Where do you fall? Because it matters if we're going to be friends. It's like, dang. (laughs) And and here's what I would say. They love when I do the little... (laughs) I'm really good at it. It's like a velociraptor. I was a junior high pastor for too long. And and here's where it comes into context for us as the greater community of Christ, the church, the bride of Christ, is that we can be different. We cannot be identified as our in our divide. We can be devoted to Jesus and his love. That we can disagree in certain contexts and certain realities, but we will ultimately unify in Christ. And in a world that is divided, we need a unified church. We are to be unified in Christ and Christ alone. We come from a vast difference, an array of different places, states, mindsets, realities in which we live. Maybe different age, maybe a different understanding. You were raised a little bit different than, than, than the next person. But let me just tell you, our diversity does not have to be rooted in uniformity. That No, it can be rooted in the fact that Jesus forms us all in the image of of God and we are formed to be more functional than the rest of the world and that's real and that's his word and the reality is we get weary and we drift we find ourselves going away from what God's commanded to us and there's two essential commands that ultimately encompass all the other commands in scripture, and he, he calls us to two great things, the great commission and the great commandment. And in this, it's going to give us an understanding of the topic that we'll topple today. And the topic that we're going to lean into is the, the topic of race and the realities in which we see in this world. And how are we to respond as the people of God? Now, a lot of friends don't want to touch this. I don't know what to say. But what does the word say? How are we to respond? That's what we're going to go with today. And I'm just going to be um, blissfully um, willing to just assume that we're all in this place to say we are so desperately wanting to be united on this and not divided on this as the church. Can I assume that today? You know what happens when you assume? You don't really know for sure is what they say. That's how that saying goes. Did you learn it different? Repent. Just kidding. But we will assume that the word of the Lord is in us and we're willing to wrestle with this to see how am I supposed to participate in this area. 
And we'll be in a few different places today in scripture. The first place I want to go is in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. All throughout this, this collection of talks, this is really, Romans 12 is kind of the, the theme throughout this. And it says this, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Verse 10, it says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Doesn't that sound like Jesus? I mean, Paul was the person that put this to paper. But let me tell you, it's the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I love how Romans uh, 12, 9 and uh, uh, 10 say it in the New Living Translation. It says like this, don't just pretend to love, you, uh, love others. Boy, we are so good about this. We play passive aggressive so good and we just pretend. Praise the Lord, brother. Hallelujah. Welcome to church. Like, did you hear so-and-so? I hate them. <laughs> wow. It says, don't pretend, but really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tight to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. If this is our role, if this is our responsibility, if this is for us to understand that our love must be sincere, it must be connected to something that is so secure and far exceeds any circumstance or any situation, it has to be connected at the core to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and this is what Jesus says. These are his words and the things that he's called us to operate in his ways. If you go with me to Matthew chapter 28, Matthew 28, 19, this is commonly known as the Great Commission. These are Jesus' parting words as he ascended to heaven. He says, hey, wait here and pray. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And greater things you're going to do than I've ever done. And we're like, Jesus, there's no way. He's like, no, just wait. Check me. Trust me. And he says, I'm going to go prepare a place. But here's what I want you to do. This is exactly what I want you to do and who I want you to do it for. He doesn't tell us how to do it because he knows that no matter what time, season, place we're in, the application, the, the, the methodology is going to shift because we got to do it a little bit differently, kind of practically, in whatever day we're in. But the reality is, is that these things will not change. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Everybody say nations. Okay, this word nations in the Greek is ethne or ethnos. It does not mean physical land properties like this country or that country. But how many of you would like to go to Fiji with me right now? Come on. Woo! Glory. We ain't going nowhere, it sounds like. Anyways, we're going to pray. And nations, right? It's, it's not this place or that place. It's this people group and this people. It literally means this race and that race. It says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And this is his command. Because this is his commission for us. Go with me now to uh, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. This is where he says when you get to this place. In the process where you feel this tension. It's, it's, it's for a purpose. And I want to let you know I saw this coming. But you guys can respond differently. He says this in Matthew 24, verse 6. He says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Did you know that no matter what goes on around us, when we accept Jesus and access the power of the Holy Spirit, we can have a peace within us. It's, it's, it's not so much that we can out identify an outside, we can identify this threat on the outside and just forfeit the internal realities. We have to still access the power of God in us as people to endure these difficulties. He says so much so, he says, but see to it that you're not alarmed. If he's called us to it, he's going to grace us through it. That's pithy and cute, you'll remember that. So such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Now, let, let, me, let me pause before I get here. Stay right there with me in verse 7. A lot of people want to try to identify where we are specifically in what day we are. Some people are saying, oh, now the Lord's coming tomorrow or he's coming on this day. Here's the reality. The Bible is very clear and it's in the same portion of scripture. He says, no one knows but the father, not even the son. But he does say, you'll know the signs. And here's some of the signs. To the season. Okay? He says, nation will rise up against nation. Ethne will rise up against ethne. This race will rise up against this. Is this, do we see any of this? 
And I just think in different generations, we can make a case for this conversation. And I don't want to be arrogantly uh, obtrusive and try to place myself in my season of life in, in, in this most providential place. But I will say we cannot dismiss the reality in which we see all around us. It says there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Verse 8. He says, all of these are just the beginning of the birth pains. How many of you have given birth before? I had a burrito a couple weeks ago. I thought, I was, you know, I was like, you, you know, some of you ladies are like, yeah, I'm going to talk to your wife. I'm talking to her. There's pains association, associated with birthing, but what we know on the other side of delivery is new life. And so when we see these signs, these symptoms, and these circumstances, we can endure through the difficulty and not divide like the rest of the world. Amen? Because the pain of where we're at is the problem. And we can constantly reproduce it as we go, as the world goes. Or we can come back to Jesus and say, Jesus, how do we engage as your people? Because let me just say it like this. There's a lot of history here. And we have Jesus in our hearts, but we got our great-grandparents in our bones. And what does not get healed gets handed down. Whether overt or covert, whether conscious or subconscious, we live in a day and an age in the culture where we have to come to the table of discussion and say, how are we to help in this area? Title of my talk today Title of my talk, if you're a note taker, I would encourage you to be. Um, the title is this, Like a Good Neighbor. Like a good neighbor. <laughs> What's your name? Jake. What are you wearing? Khakis. <laughs> my friend Jake's up in the booth. He didn't wear khakis today. I should have gave him an update. Sorry, bro. <laughs> Can I get the Rogers deal? Like a good Neighbor, We're going to land in this portion of scripture and break this down and hopefully this helps us all get a better understanding of how we are to engage because we don't want to just be bad neighbors. We don't even just want to be neighbors. We want to engage in this life to be a good neighbor as God's called us to engage in this area, this tension that is constantly dividing. We want to be the church that's unified and the way that we can do that is we can play a practical piece in the greater power of God moving forward in this area. Amen? Go with me now to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. This is commonly known as the Good Samaritan. Luke chapter 10. I'm going to read this to us, break it down, and give us some practical points. It says this. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So just noted, verse 27, this is the great command. Love God, love people, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? Verse 28. He says, you have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. In this area, we see so many friends trying to justify themselves. That's a conversation in itself. He says, so he asked Jesus, and who's my neighbor? You ever try to get out of something and, and you start asking questions to try to kind of negate the reality and, and you hit kind of a little bit higher pitch? You're like, and, and who, who, who's, my, who, who's my neighbor? Like, who, who do you think? Who do you say is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They're like, where'd you go, Jesus? <laughs> we were talking face to face and you went somewhere. You, you didn't, you turned, you didn't use your blinker. What happened? Jesus now is, is moving from this place where this man stands before him. It says that he stood up, which is a sign of reverence but it says that he stood to test him. So now, all, all of a sudden, we see a heart and a posture that are incongruent. And he says that he, he's asking this question to stand arrogantly, trying to get out of the conversation. And Jesus is going to tell him a story. It, just so you know, anytime Jesus breaks out into a story, it's because there's a lesson or a whooping coming. 
My mom was a whoopologist. Anybody? <laughs> She's like, what do you want? How do you want it? I was like, what do you mean? She's like, you want the switch? You want the spoon? You want the shoe? I was like, I don't want any of it, please. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side, he says, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. This word pity can also be interpreted mercy or compassion. Verse 34, it says, when he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave it to them, uh, to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Which of these three, Jesus comes back from the story, out of character, comes back to the conversation. He says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. There are intricacies and details and context to this portion, portion of scripture that will help equip us to identify how we are and to engage in this conversation. And I believe that this is gonna be helpful for us moving forward as a unified front. And what I want to help us ultimately understand is how we are to be a good neighbor. And in this day, there was bigotry. There was racial divide. There was racism. I have one friend, he says it like this, I'm not racist, I hate everybody. I'm like, wow, <laughs> tell me how you really feel. But the problem is, is that Oftentimes, we're more committed to our culture than we are to Christ. And Jesus is going to help bring this full circle, come back to the place how we are to operate in a way that would honor and love people in spite of what has been or where we are or what's to come. This is the call and the commissioning of God. And so I have a few quick talking points I'd love to give to us. And the first one is this. I'm going to ask some questions as the question was posed. And I'm going to pose some, some, some thoughts here. And number one, write this down if you would. The first one is this. Who can I be a good neighbor to? Who can I be a good neighbor to? Because I think it's easy for us to identify with our lens, our life, our upbringing, our exposures... And how I live in this life is dependent upon the way that I've learned in this life. There's an old saying, you're a sum total of your past exposures. I would say that's true in part, but when the person of Jesus comes into our life, we're not bound to those knee-jerk realities. We get to live in the freedom of life. But yet, the way that we form our understanding and the way that we see it is based in the way, oftentimes, that we look. This is about shifting the responsibility of putting this on others and placing it on myself and saying, I'm going to take some ownership in this and ask myself, who can I be a good neighbor to? And here's how we can learn who. Because in this, it says on this occasion, the expert in the law stood up to test Jesus and ask him this question, how do I... How do I inherit eternal life? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. We are so good at loving ourselves and the neighbors that look like, sound like, live like us. It's easy, right? This is natural, friends. You're not alone. Sundays are the most segregated day of the week. Why? Because we don't live out the great commission or command the way that Jesus called us to. Why? And, and, and here's my reality. I, I, I don't put this on anybody. If there's some friends that want to gather with some people that they feel like they can let their hair down one day a week, praise God, bless them. But there's something greater. There's something better that we don't have to be limited to our likeness. We can be empowered by his love. And in this, this context, it's, it's king because it helps reveal some things that we wouldn't see otherwise. Because it says that this man 
was on this road and he was unconscious and naked. Did you know in this day, the way that they identified who was their neighbor and who belonged to them is based on their vernacular and their appearance. How do you talk and how you look is dependent upon whether or not you're my neighbor. Do we have any affinity? And they're saying this brother is knocked out and naked. So what we have to assess here is an understanding that is true today. And it's called this, group think. It's in-group and out-group biases. Based on your exposures, your upbringing, your reality, your ethnicity, your world, what, what you were raised in, you have in-group and out-group bias. You have a group think. We all do. But what Jesus is calling us to in this is to get outside of ourselves and start to engage with others selflessly. And he's saying, who's my neighbor? I can't identify if this dude's my neighbor or not because I can't hear the way he talks. I can't really see the way he looks. I remember when I moved to this area in 1993. Come on. I, I moved from Las Vegas, Nevada. You ever been there? Anybody? We're going to have an altar call at the end of the gathering and pray for y'all. And, and when I moved here, there were two things. It was, it was climate shock. It was like 78 degrees and I'm wearing a sweatshirt and people are like, what are wrong with you? I was like, I'm freezing. That's what's wrong. I just left 120. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and, and then it was culture shock. I moved to Puyallup, Washington, and I didn't know there was that many white people in one place. I just, it wasn't my thing. I just didn't know. I grew up in a very different context. I grew up in a very multicultural community. I, I, there was probably, it was probably four or five blocks of another uh, person that looked like me that I lived in this dynamic. But my world was wrapped around this beautiful expression of God's gift of his image. Did you know that we all are the image bearers of God? All of us. And the vastness of the goodness of God cannot be limited to one expression of image. That we are all created in his like image, but we're all called to be one in him, no matter how we look on the outside, how we live, how we talk, how we walk. Because when I came here and I started walking and talking, and, 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 and I used to wear my pants down a little lower. Anybody? Because I wanted them to see that little emblem, the guess. I was like, that's not a question. 125. No, stop. And, 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 and you know, I, I just came from a little different cultural background. Ground, but I didn't feel like I belonged as much as some of these friends looked like me. I was like, this is not my lot in life. This isn't what I was exposed to. So based on the demograph of how you talk and how you look is ultimately how we identify who we're called to. And the problem in all of this is that we deduce this down to our comfort. But the call of God would call us outside of our comfort zones to engage with people that look like, talk like, act like, and have lived way different than us. Did you know you should read books? Did you know you should also read people? That there's people in proximity to you and I that will help us become educated in a greater way, in a greater degree, that we can learn about the greatness of God through the image bearers of those people that don't look like or sound like or dress like or act like you. And this is how he's called us to be connected at the core, by willingly, willingness to commit our lives, connect our lives, and not just ask the question of who's my neighbor based on who looks like, sounds like, talks like me, but who's my neighbor because everyone's my neighbor around me, and how can I listen and learn to their life? I don't know the plight or the pain of people of color in our context today, but I know I want to listen. I know I want to learn. There's so much to be said about this area, and I do not believe that this one conversation is going to fix it all, but I believe this is going to start us on a path of healing. When we can ask the question, who can I be a good neighbor to? We can start to open our eyes to the reality of there's so many people around us that we were unaware of before. Number two, it's not just who can I be a good neighbor to, but how can I be a good neighbor? How can I be a good neighbor? Because again, in the context of the conversation in Luke 10.30, Luke 10.30, it says a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. 
A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. In verse 32, it says, so to a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him and passed by on the other side. Now, the context of the day is that this is a real road that still is there today. This road from, from Jericho, or Jerusalem to Jericho is, is about 17 or 18 miles in length. And when they say he went down a road, it literally goes down. It drops in about a half of a mile of elevation over the course of this 17 miles. So in this, you can see things from afar, right? Um, but, but it says that the priest and the Levite decided to go on the other side. And, and, and I've heard the priest and the Levite get beat up over the years. Anybody in church ever heard, don't be the priest, don't be the Levite, right? But what, I think what we miss here is their reality. Can I, can I lean into this just a little bit? So this is my speculation, but this is congruent with the context of the day. So the priest and the Levite worked in the temple. These were people that worked the temple. The priest was kind of the varsity priest, and the Levite was like the C team. Like, brother ain't even gonna make it to JV. Like, bump it on down, give me some water, right? You've been on those teams before. Like, okay. What's the play? It doesn't matter. Sit down. <laughs> Go team. Get out of the way. Okay. And so the, the, the priest, it says that he passed by on the other side. But what we don't realize is that the priest was working the temple. He left the temple. He was probably doing it for a couple weeks. Now he's bringing home the offerings and everything that he was given for his family to survive. So he's leaving this place with the things. He was not walking. He was probably riding. He was kind of in a different socioeconomical status. And he's riding along the way. But the reality is that on a 17, 18 mile road with that type of drop, you can see something down there. And this road was notorious. They knew that robbers lived on this road. It was such a known road that you could get something, get someone, and get off the road and go hide in the desert and make your way somewhere else. But this was a road common and understood in the context. So what he's saying here is that he could see him from afar, but he still made the same decision to sidestep the brother. Why? Well, if you understand the day that th there were some laws intact, Jews didn't associate with Samaritans or anyone seen or perceived to be dead. So if a Levite or a priest, just like any of the other uh, 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 Pharisees or anyone uh, given to these positions, if they were ever perceived to be within six cubits, which a cubit is about from your elbow to the tip of your finger, if they were ever seen to be perceived in proximity of someone perceived dead, they themselves would have to go give themselves to the ceremonial cleansings and take themselves out of the priestly rotation, which would mean they would lose the means of providing for their family. So too is the Levite. So as much as he could see these things from afar and say to himself, what am I going to do when I get there? He already knew based on his religion what was required. Did you know religion is oftentimes the issue in this area? is that we miss that this whole thing is not based on do's and don'ts. It's all based on the one who is and was and is to come. That he who is free should be free indeed. We should not be bound to any ritualistic routine. We should not be bound to a religion that would dictate or determine our ability to engage with empathy. The problem is, is religion oftentimes will limit our reach and give us a view that allows us to have sympathy, but keeps us from proximity of having deeper empathy. And we think to ourselves, man, I just feel so bad. Well, feeling bad happens from afar. Feeling their pain happens in proximity. Carrying the weight of their reality. Listening, learning, going, oh my gosh, what was it like for you growing up? Can I tell you a quick story? I'm going to anyways. A couple years ago, I was living in the Portland area. We were pastoring a church down there. And God delivered me and he brought me back home. Just kidding. We love Oregon. And uh, 
I was, I was in the downtown area. Uh, I had a meeting in about an hour, and I was at a coffee shop, and I had to get some stuff done. So I'm like working, doing my thing. I'm like, man, I don't want to talk to anybody. Don't make eye contact, right? Uh, just get your stuff done. You're like, no, you're a pastor. I was like, I got, I got stuff to do. And uh, if you see someone, just look down. Hey, okay, God bless. And um, it's like, get on an airplane. What do you do? I'm a pastor. Uh, earphones. <laughs> There goes the conversation. So I'm sitting in this coffee shop going, I, I, I got to get some stuff down. And then I see this friend sit down, African-American friend. Um, he, he was being interviewed. I don't know what the interview was about at the time. I just knew the day before was when the Colin Kaepernick campaign came out. And he was the campaign guy of Just Do It. Where I lived was in the heart of Nike. Nike World Headquarters. Once a month, I would wear Adidas on the stage so that the people that worked for Nike in the crowd would come up to me after and be like, here, pastor, we want to give this to you. I was like, oh, God bless you. I'm like, yes. So I'm sitting in this place. I'm seeing this friend being interviewed. I see the T-shirt he's wearing. Just do it. Like, like there's, there's something to be said here. Like, he, he's, he, he's want to say something here. And, and this interview is going, and I'm literally going, okay, i got to get my stuff done. I'd love to talk to this friend, but i got stuff to do. And I've got a headache. You ever get a headache? Like, I'm out. Like, headaches used to be a thing like, ah, I don't feel good. Today, they're like, ah, no, I got a headache. What's going on? Where are we? we got to get COVID tested. Anyways, so I'm sitting there. And I go, oh, I just gotta, I gotta get to my meeting. And I feel like the Holy Spirit says, I, are you available? I'm offended now. Am I available? I'm a pastor. Well, I just wanna know if you're available because I'd love for you to lean in here. Oh, okay. So the friend leaves. He's sitting there. He's kind of flustered. And I go, hey, brother, can, can, can I sit with you? Do you mind? He's like, uh, sure, sit down. And I just kind of, I go, hey, I'm just, I know the, the tension of where we are today. I saw your shirt. I didn't know what was going on. It seems like you're a little fresh. Could you tell me a little bit more about what it's like to be you in this world in this day? And he's like, uh, what? What? I was like, hey, I just, I just would love to listen and learn a little bit through your lens and your reality of what you're living through. I just can't. Obviously, can't even begin to imagine. He's like, what? What? Yeah. And for about the next 10 minutes, he continues to thank me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But for real, can, will you share? And for the succeeding weeks, upwards of six weeks, about four weeks into this, he finds out what I do. He's like, wait a minute. I was like, that wasn't why. Sincere. Willingness. To engage, what I found out at that point is that he is the official DJ of the Portland Trailblazers. That he has a mass influence in the entire community. That he's a Jesus follower, got saved, set free from a cult, wrote a book, and is helping point people to Jesus in a powerful way. But it's the spirit of willingness and inquiry. This is, this is how... And the question isn't just how, but when, right? So the first talking point is who? Who can I be a neighbor to? The second question is how? How can I be a neighbor? We have to be willing to inquire. We can't just inquire because here's how we oftentimes create conversations. We listen to respond. We don't listen to learn. When we listen to respond, we can't learn. Did you know you can't learn when you're not listening? You can't learn when you're talking? We have to listen in a way that would engage at a deeper level because we have to become reflective to become responsive. And as much as the priest and the Levite had this vantage point that Brent brought about sympathy, they had no proximity to ultimately cultivate empathy, to a deeper understanding of God's beautiful creation in that image bearer they've lived through, they've you know, labored through, they've endured pains and problems that I could never understand. But if I'm willing to say, this is how, I'm gonna predetermine and be willing to press in to be responsive. This is when I can be a good neighbor. You ready? When, so it's who, how, and when can I be a good neighbor? Any and always, any time and always, the opportunity presents itself. Because the greatest ability is our availability. Say that with me. Our greatest ability is our availability. Come on, write it in the chat. You're watching online. 
And what happened here, it says, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, he came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him, which is the same word, mercy, compassion. He went to him, bandaged him, pouring out on oil and wine. Then he put him on his own donkey, brought him to the inn, took care of him, and the next day he took out two denarii, I gave it to them, the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you. There's 10 things that the Samaritan did in this moment that didn't take proactivity. It just took availability. A willingness to say, whenever I have the opportunity to engage, I'm going to be willing and available. I'm going to engage in spite of circumstance, in spite of that meeting, in spite of this headache. Friends, are we led by the Holy Spirit or are we led by ourselves? We are prompted, empowered, and graced to stay in step with the Holy Spirit. And let me tell you, if our steps are not leading us to places that cost us our comfort, we're not walking in his calling. So how, when, whenever we have the opportunity, whenever we see an injustice, Whenever we can hear, lend our ear to someone else to say, what does it look like for you? How do I listen and lean in? And fourth and finally, it's why. Why? Why can I be a good neighbor? The starting point in this entire portion of scripture in Luke 10, 25 says, The expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. The tensions, I believe, oftentimes are tethered to our indignant postures that are unwilling to listen or learn from anyone else. And and, and let me just say it like this. Does that sound like Jesus? No. He's called us to be learners. Do you know what the word disciple means? Learner. That we're to listen, we're to learn, we're to lean in in relationship. We're not going to just look from afar and say, oh man, I feel bad. But change the channel, what's on next? That doesn't carry the heart of God to carry the heart of others to understand how they're hurting and the pain and the reality. And I believe in our country in this day, we've gone from a place of acceptability where it was like culturally congruent. It's okay. Well, I'm not racist, I hate everyone. Well, that's a big problem. And we go to this place of just turning a blind eye to becoming even aware but, but apologetic. Like, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. I'm not going to do anything, but I feel bad. But I believe we can get to a deeper place where we're available and willing to engage. And we, not, we might not have all the answers. This is what I hear from the hearts of most, most Jesus people. I don't know how to help. We don't, we, we don't need to create brave spaces. We need to empower courageous people that are willing to say, I just, I see you, I love you, what, I want to lean in. I don't know what to do, but I'm willing to do whatever I can in my power. That might help some people, I believe, amen? Because in this world that's so divided, why would anyone want to be a part of this family if we're not united? Well, it's just like them. Now all of a sudden we get caught up in their conversation, us and them. There is no us and them. This is us. This is a family, and we are committed and connected and congruently at the core, unified in Christ Jesus. This is what he says in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, says this. You are saved, I'll I'll paraphrase 8 9. You're saved by grace through faith. At least none of us boast. This is not of our own doing. This is the gift of God. Right? In verse 10, he goes on. He says, for we are God's handiwork. Other translations say masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Hold it right there on verse 10. Masterpiece, handiwork. What he has created is kind of like a puzzle. It's a masterpiece. And friends, if your piece is missing, it's not a complete picture. No matter how big, how small, the reality is, is that he's created us to paint a beautiful picture that we all come together under God's royal authority and citizenship that eternally will be in heaven with him forever. And he says, I want heaven to come to earth that other people outside the understanding of the goodness of God would come into the household of faith. And why would they come into something that is as just as dysfunctional as those that are outside of the church? Well, why aren't churches talking about this? Because it comes at a cost. Can I tell you? 
I've had multiple people tell me, yep, I'm not comfortable with that conversation. I'm out. You know what I said? Bye. Bless you. But just remember, wherever you go, there you are. That in this world, the reality in which God is leading his people is based in conviction and deep connection to other people. He's given us this thing called the ministry of reconciliation. But reconciliation is not the ministry. The ministry is helping people not go to hell. But we keep fighting these sideways conversations that keep us off task. The devil works more in distraction and division than he does in anything else. And this is one of the greatest dupes the devil has sucked us into. But we ain't going to play his game no more. We are his masterpiece created to be together. And this is what he calls us to in Ephesians 2, 14. It says this, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Goes on, it says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. I love that word. That is, it, it's also pronounced hostility. The law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from two, thus making Peace, verse 16, and I'll welcome up the keys. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death enmity, hostility. This is what he came to do. He came to connect us at the core, back to Jesus Christ, calling us to himself. And friends, we have Jesus in our hearts, but we have historical realities in which we've lived in that we have to uproot and realize there is people in this world that we should love deeper by giving ourselves devotedly to listening and learning. And we can do a real good job standing afar and feeling bad, like, oh man, oh, I just feel so terrible. Sympathy without proximity never brings us to empathy because it's about a deep commitment and contending for anyone, anywhere to come to this place of saying, Jesus is Lord, and I know it because of your love. This is the attributes of Jesus. This is the call of God for the entire church. How do we know this isn't about anything other than him in all of his creation? Is that even when we get to heaven, they're not going to say, who was your pastor? What church did you go to? They're going to say, you planted in the house of the Lord, you flourished in the courts of your God. What, what did you do with my son? What did you do with my bride? And let me tell you about the beauty of the expression. Did you know that they're just purely based on head count of our planet, heaven's gonna be more brown than anything else. Did you know there was no white people in the Bible? And this is what the book of Revelation says when it all concludes. Revelation chapter seven, verse nine, it says that a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages. This is God's creation. This is his plan from command to commission. He says, ethne, different people group. We're called to be these people that come together, that are committed, that are devoted, that are diligent, that are faithful, that we don't stand at a distance. We go the distance. There's another portion of scripture where Jesus has some Samaritans call from afar, but they're, 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 they're in this colony uh, struggling with this disease called leprosy. And it says this in Luke 17, it says, as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, master, have pity, mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said, go, show yourselves to the priests. And they went and they were cleansed. It says that they came back, 10 of them, one of them giving praise. And he was a Samaritan. There was this indignant difficulty in relationship. I'm not even talking about the details of them being lepers and unable to be welcomed. We have no idea about what it means to be socially distant and wear masks. What he says is, he doesn't stand at a distance, he goes the distance. But he tells us to get cleansed. He tells us to come to him. He tells us that he is good in all of this. And like a good neighbor, Jesus is there. 
and he's called us to be there for those that feel far from from reality whether they're marginalized disenfranchised dismissed looked over what it doesn't matter what matters is that God's called us all to be one in him and it's going to take a concertive effort and it's going to come at a cost of comfort and the call is this it's clear we're not going to just be bad neighbors or neighbors we're going to be good neighbors which means we lean in to listen to learn to love to have proximity to have deeper empathy to help others that we would come become more aware of who he is based in the creation that he's placed all around us amen amen come on let's give him some praise on that amen